Hey, last week we kicked off a brand new series entitled Let's Be That Church. And, and obviously so many incredible activities taking place this month with outreach and serving people. It's the heart of our church. But today I wanna to talk to you about the title and the subject that that church needs power. That church needs power. How many of you know you need God's power in your life? I was thinking this week and reflecting on when I was a, a young boy and it really kind of amazes me that I can still remember this moment, but I was around seven years old, and, and my mom and dad, man, they were in church every single week. I mean, we went Sunday morning, we went Sunday night, we went Wednesday night. If there was prayer, we were there. Man, they brought me all, all, all over the place. I was bound to be saved. <laughs> you know what I mean? I grew up in church, and my, my dad worked a, a job as a pharmacist. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, but man, they, they loved the Lord and really prioritize the things of God. And I just wanna encourage parents in here, you never know when the day's gonna come that your child's gonna receive Christ. You just never know. You just keep planting seeds, keep being faithful, keep coming and prioritizing church. Amen, everybody? And I remember one night, it was a Sunday night, and that's like the save, save bunch. They already come in the morning, and they there Sunday night. And yeah, that's a super Christian right there. Superhero. And I, I'll never forget it. We were coming in the building. We were sitting down, and there were pews. And I remember there was red carpet. And the place was just, just packed. I mean, people just coming in. And it, it was like, really, people wanted to be there. Like, you could tell. And I, I, I wasn't like this some special seven-year-old. Man, I was into normal things that seven-year-olds are into. I like Fraggle Rock, okay? I like Saved by the Bell, okay? I, I like, you know, Ninja Turtles. The list goes on and on. It wasn't like I was some little prophet. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why that was funny, but uh, I, I came to church, and, and I remember just sitting there, and the service hadn't even started yet. It hadn't even started, but the orchestra it's back when you had orchestra, and man, they're doo doo doo. They're playing the little instruments, and it, you just you could just feel this this presence and this spirit in the room that I never felt before, and it was like a joy, a peace, a passion, an excitement, like like also like this this pure feeling. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And I, I will never forget in that moment, as a little boy, just knowing, I couldn't articulate it, I couldn't describe theologically or doctrinally exactly what was going on, but I knew at seven years old, God's presence is real. That his power is real. And as we talk about being that church, if we're gonna be that church, we cannot do it on our own strength. We desperately, fully, completely need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. As a parent, you need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. As a student, you need the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. And I want y'all to help me preach a little bit today, okay? I know we got different backgrounds, but just, just pretend you're Pentecostal today, okay? Just pretend. Just give me an amen. Shout hallelujah. Do something. Wave at me. I don't care. But help me out today. Amen, everybody? Amen. This is what the Bible says, Acts chapter 1. We're going to have fun. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Jesus has been resurrected. It says this, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. How many of you are thankful you serve a risen king who is alive and well? He says, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, I like that Jesus was resurrected, but he's still eating. I mean, this is a good Cajun right here, man. I know he's Jewish, but he would have fit in good in South Louisiana, everybody. He's eating with them, and he gave them this command. So I want you to picture this. Here we are, they're eating. And he says, hey, guys, I want you to lean in. And he says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. So he's already been talking about it. The repetition causes things to stick. And so he's reminding them, hey, 
You need to wait. He says, for John, speaking of John the Baptist, baptized with water. Oh, I like this. But in a few days, you will be. Not maybe. Not if, man, if things work out. You will be. It's definitive. It is definite. It's happening. You can take it to the bank. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Just skip down a little bit. You'll see it in your notes. It says, Jesus continues talking. He says, but you will receive, help me out. What's the word say? Power Power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I want to talk to you about what took place here because this is very monumental. And I know we're familiar with it. I know a lot of us know this story. We know Jesus had died and he'd been buried and he's resurrected, which is a pretty big deal. He conquered death. He's resurrected. And then for 40 days, the Bible says, 40 is a number of testing. You see it all throughout scripture. It's a very important number throughout the Bible. Moses went on Mount Sinai for how many days? 40 days. You guys are getting it. Jesus was thrown out into the wilderness for how many days? Okay. The, the, the rain and the floods took place for how many days and nights? Okay. How many disciples were there? Okay, good. You guys were, y'all are good, man. Oh, I about had you. But for 40 days, Jesus was just appearing to him. Oh boy, I would have fun with this. I mean, y'all, y'all had that supernatural gift just to boom. I'd be scaring the daylights out of people. I mean, I'd be showing up on people's car when they get mad in traffic as a believer. I'd say, hey, don't you do that. Some of y'all need that every single day. But sometimes we forget Jesus is with us. Amen, everybody. But he's just showing up, just boom, appearing. And he gathers them together. And this is such an interesting moment because here he is, he's alive. Man, they got momentum on their side. You don't slow down momentum. You ride momentum. Any sports fans in the house? <laughs> you, you're never going to watch a basketball team, say LSU's playing basketball, and they're just knocking down threes, and the coach be like, time out, time out. Boys, come over here. You're shooting and playing too good. <laughs> I need you, to, need you to settle down a little bit. Why? Because we ride momentum. Any leader capitalizes on momentum. But Jesus, here he is. He's alive. He says, hey, guys, this is what I want you to do next. Lean into this. Peter, you with me? Thomas, you doubting me? <laughs> he says, I want you to wait. Now, how many of y'all know that's not what they wanted to hear? How many of y'all, you just, you just love waiting? You're like, man, you know what I want to do today when I leave Healing Place? I want to sit in that parking lot as long as possible. <laughs> just, just, there's people on the road. Just let me sit here and wait a little longer. We don't like waiting. But you know what Jesus understood? Jesus knew that momentum will last for a moment, but the Spirit can sustain someone for a lifetime. Jesus knew that what he was about to do in them and through them was so much bigger than them. And I just want to remind you today that the things that God has called you to and who's called you to be, it's bigger than you, everybody. You can't do it on your own strength, your own might. In fact, Zechariah, who's a prophet in the Old Testament, the Bible, God says, hey, Zechariah, I want you to write to this guy named Zerubbabel. Say that five times fast. Zerubbabel. And he was going back to rebuild the temple. And this is what he said to Zerubbabel. He said, it's not by might, nor by power, but it's by your spirit. And you say, what are you talking about, David? I thought you said we need power. But you know what God was telling Zerubbabel through the prophet? Zerubbabel, it's not by your might. It's not by your power. But if you're going to accomplish what I've called you to accomplish, you're going to be who I've called you to be. It has to be through my spirit. Come on, can we clap our hands for the spirit of God right now? I love, I love 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. It says, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. Y'all know some talkers? Man, I get around some people, they don't stop talking. I'm like, man, you need to take a break. <laughs> just talking, talking, talking. He says, the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk, but it's living by God's power. And Jesus knew you guys are going to need some power. His disciples are going to need some power. Guess what? I need his power. You need his power. And I'm so thankful to be part of a church that prioritizes the power of the Holy Spirit. I am so thankful that we have pastors and leaders and volunteers and a staff that we don't walk around 
when Sunday comes and thinking, oh, I got a good word today. I'm just going to wow the people. Oh, no, man. There is a desperation that if it's just my words, those words will fall to the ground. But if the Holy Ghost shows up, somebody's life can turn around. I'm thankful for the outreaches that we do. We go serve people. And I love that we give, go to Waffle House or go here and there, serve people, give things away. But how do you know if we don't have the power of the Holy Ghost, that life ain't going to change? We got to have the power. I'm thankful for this worship team, man. They are awesome. And our campuses are incredible. They up here singing. But we don't just need nice songs, just nice pretty words coming out of people's mouths. We need the power of the Spirit to fall and for lives to be transformed. I'm going to preach, even if you don't help me. (laughs) Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Day of Pentecost. Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. This is what took place. So many things to highlight. I just have two things I'm going to highlight because of the sake of time. It says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. What were they doing? They were waiting. They listened to the words of Jesus. They were waiting. They weren't moving. They were waiting. Some of you, you are in a waiting season right now. And you don't like what you see. You don't like what you feel. How do I know that? Because I've had many of them. But every waiting season I've experienced, I've come to the other side knowing that God was doing a lot of work while I was waiting. Don't lose heart. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Don't surrender your faith. Man, keep waiting. Keep watching. Keep expecting because God's going to show up. Amen, everybody. It says, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak, speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. There was a shift that took place in this moment on the day of Pentecost. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon somebody to fulfill a task or to complete an assignment. And then the Holy Spirit would be removed from that person. But on the day of Pentecost, and Jesus prophesied this and said it's gonna happen in Acts chapter one, verse eight, he says, you will be filled with power. Now the Holy Spirit, whether you realize it or not, if you confess Jesus as Lord, he lives on the inside of you. That means that power of God is available, not just on Sunday, but on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, any day that ends with a Y, my friend. And that power is ready and available to you. But what took place? What happened? What happened when the power of the Holy Spirit fell? First thing I want you to know is this. His power brings salvation. His power brings salvation. They were speaking in tongues. It was not their native tongue. This God can do the supernatural. And all these people are listening and hearing, and they traveled to Jerusalem for Pentecost, thousands of them. And they're like, what is this? This Galilean is speaking my language. And they were glorifying God in other languages. And then Peter steps up, the Bible says. He didn't have anybody playing keys behind him. He didn't have worship before. He just steps up. And the Bible says that he preached the cross. He preached Jesus. He preached the gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection. And 3,000 That's a lot of folks. 3,000 people believed, and watch this, and were baptized that day. Say, man, what are you trying to say, David? I'm glad you asked. The Holy Spirit can save anyone, anywhere, at any time. I'm going to say it again. The Holy Spirit can save anyone, anywhere, at any time. Some of you right now, you're thinking about the loss of the loss that you know. You're thinking, man, you don't know my family. You don't know my neighbor. You don't know my coworker. They so lost, they smell like smoke. They smell like fire. They lost, lost. They're on their way to hell. Can I tell you, when the Holy Spirit shows up, he can save anybody, anywhere, at any time. Because here's the thing. I can't save nobody, and neither can you. You can't coerce somebody into salvation. 
You can't preach to them so much that finally they're just like, oh, I get it. It has to be the Holy Spirit. In fact, 1 Corinthians says that. It says that in order for somebody to say that Jesus is Lord, they can't do it except by who? The Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit shows up, man, he can save anybody, anywhere, at any time. This summer, I had two experiences that really, the Lord just reminded me of his power to save people. I'm going to tell them to you. The first one was this. I was preaching at a church in Picayune, Mississippi. Somebody say, God bless Picayune. I just like saying Picayune. And I'd preached a sermon there, and the service had dismissed, and there was a guy over to my right-hand side. People were out in the foyers. People were leaving in their cars. And there was this big guy. He's a big dude over on my right-hand side. And, man, he was just sitting there. And he looked like he had lived a rough life, rough life. And, and he had his, his face in his hands. And he's just bawling, crying. You would not expect, if you just saw this guy, you would not be like, oh, you know, he's going to be at church today crying. You just wouldn't think that. And so I, I felt in my heart, hey, Go witness to him. But you know, you, you, sometimes you sense those things and sometimes you're like, okay, was that me? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay. And so I go over there and I'm going to talk to him. And right as I come up to talk to him, two people from the church go and they start talking to him. So I thought, okay, well, I guess, I guess he knows the Lord. You know, maybe they, they know him and they know his story. And so I just, I just kind of back off. Well, I go and I get in my truck a few minutes later and my mama was with me. And we're in the truck, and I remember this about that day. It was hot. June and Picayune. That rhymed. Hot. And so I get in my truck, and here comes that big guy walking right beside me, and I felt it again. And listen, I'm not bragging at all. Like, I'm witnessing to him at church. That's like serving chicken at Chick-fil-A. You know, it's not like, hey, look at me. It's come to be expected. And so here he is walking past me. I get out of the car and I said, hey, man, I'm David. What's your name? He said, my name's Stephen. He's got tears just coming down his face. I said, Stephen, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? He said, no, sir, I do not have a relationship with him. I've been living for the world. I've been going after the things of the world and I'm just dying on the inside. He said, my mama is saved and I've been running from God. And I said, Stephen, do you want to pray right now and welcome the Spirit of God and Jesus in your life? Right now, you can do that. He said, I want to do it right now. And there we were. Amen. You can clap your hands for that. There we were. Sweating. Sweating. And I don't like sweating with jeans on, but this was worth it, everybody. I was sweating, praying. And I thought after that prayer and that young man said yes to Jesus, I thought, I wonder how many times his mama has sought after the face of Jesus. I wonder how many times other family members have been praying for Stephen. I want to tell some mamas in here, some daddies in here, some uncles in here, some nieces in here, some nephews in here, some co-workers in here. Don't stop praying for people. Come on, give him praise if you believe it. Because you don't know. Because the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, can save anybody, anywhere, anytime. Another story. Y'all cool with this story? Story time with David. We were in Spain this summer at our campus there, a phenomenal campus. I see some people who were there with us, and we heard that week there was a young lady who was very involved in the church. She had been serving for years. She has been all in, but her husband didn't come to church, was an atheist, did, had nothing to do with God, and she came to us midweek, and he, she said, hey, my husband's coming Sunday. Let's just believe God something's going to happen. And I remember we were having service that day, and I'm telling you, Pastor Mike, we had an outpouring of God's presence, man. It was powerful. Everybody, these people came and flooded the altar. We're praying for people, and I'm thinking about this guy the whole time. I was preaching that day, and I was thinking about him. I was preaching and thinking and praying about him. And here he comes up. I look over. Pastor Jeffrey Rents has his arms around this man, and that guy that day, he's all in crime in his mid fifties, been far away from God all of his life. And in one moment, one encounter, the Holy ghost saved that man. Come on, give him praise, man. That's awesome. His wife 
text the campus pastors later that day. She said, we are out at a coffee stop and he uh, stop coffee shop. And you won't believe this. He still can't stop crying. What happens when the Holy Spirit shows up? Day of Pentecost, 3,000 get saved. Can I tell you, God is still in the saving business today. He's still in the saving business. Second thing is this. I only have two points for you. Short and sweet. His power brings change. I like this. His power brings change. So first, his power brings salvation. Secondly, his power brings change. Before 3,000 people said yes to Jesus, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, then Peter stepped up. Four words. They leapt off the page to me this week when I was reading. Then Peter stepped up. He stepped up and he did what? He preached. Now, you can't forget that 50 days prior to this, this same guy, was by a campfire, filled with fear, and denied Jesus that he even knew him. Now, 50 days later, here Peter is, and he is stepping up and doing what God had anointed him and called him to do. God has an ability through his spirit to change anyone, anywhere, at any time. Now, Peter was saved. He knew Jesus. He was saved. But what happened between 50 days when he lacked confidence and lacked courage to now all of a sudden he's filled with the Holy Ghost and he steps up and he preaches Jesus and 3,000 people get saved in an instant. One thing took place. It wasn't that Peter in 50 days just took a bunch of preaching classes. He just became a phenomenal orator. No, no. One thing took place. On the day of Pentecost, the early church was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter's one of those guys, I bet the disciples, when they saw him stepping up, they probably thought, is that Peter stepping up? Y'all ever see people that you used to run around with, you used to hang out with, and you think, is that Joey? Is that the same? Man, that guy's on fire for God. Is that, is that Sally? Man, Sally was crazy back in the day. <laughs> Hopefully your name's not Sally. <laughs> crazy Sally. She was crazy back in the day. But his power brings change. And this is, this is what we got to watch out for. Two things as a believer you got to watch out for, my friend. Don't minimize his power. Don't, don't, don't make God small in your life. Because we can make him big in other people's lives. Oh, God, I, you could use that person. You could use that person. You could use that person. The same God that's using them can fill and use you. They're not better than you. They're not more advanced than you. Both parties need the same work inside of them. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't minimize him. Also, when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Bible talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we're getting quiet now. As a church, we believe in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're not what's called cessationists that believe certain gifts, the manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit cease and stop to exist after the first century. We believe that the same Spirit that was working then is also working now. And if He wants to pour out His Spirit and give somebody a gift of preaching, give somebody the gift of teaching, give somebody the gift of exhortation, give somebody the gift of tongues, prophecy, words of knowledge, healing, signs and wonders, don't minimize the Holy Spirit. Don't say, hey, Holy Spirit, I need you to stay real nice and neat in this little box. He will bust your box wide open. I'm telling you. He will, he'll say, huh, that's cute. Little box. You want me in this little box? 
It will bust it wide open. I remember when I was 20 years old. This was crazy. 20 years old. I had this guy prophesy over me. He gave me a prophetic word. I wasn't looking for it. But God, for whatever reason, wanted to give me a word. God still speaks, everybody. I'll never forget it. This guy, I did not know him at all. Never met him before. Never. He, he's talking to me. He's praying over me. And I remember he pointed his finger at me. And he's a big dude. He had a deep voice. He said, he said, God is going to use you to preach to thousands. And I thought to myself, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because I wasn't clapping. <laughs> I thought to myself, I said, I don't know nobody. I, my, my dad's not in ministry. My uncle or aunt's not in ministry. I don't have some connection somewhere. I don't know Joel Olstein. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you know here. But when you know him, he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above. Don't make him small. I thought when that guy said that to me, I thought, man, this dude don't know. I'm not very good at speaking in front of people. I'd given one sermon to that point. In L.A., Lower Alabama. <laughs> with about 30 people in attendance. Half of them were my family. But God can change anyone, anywhere, anytime. Don't minimize him. This is a great prayer to pray. God, have your way in me. Holy Spirit, whatever you want to do, I'm not going to put a ceiling on what you want to do. Have your way. Don't minimize him. Second thing is this. And we're going to land the plane. Don't compartmentalize him. Now, this is going to get real for a minute. Because a lot of us, we want the benefits of his life. I want the benefits of you, God. But we don't want him touching our lifestyle. We want courage. God, give me courage. Give me confidence. Make me like William Wallace. Courage, God. I want courage, but we don't want to have anything to do with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Don't make God small in what he wants to do through you. Don't compartmentalize him in what he wants to do in you. Because God, when he does surgery, he doesn't just work on an arm. <laughs> He'll work on every aspect of your life. He'll change the way you think. He'll change the way you speak. He'll change your entertainment and what you put in front of your eyes. I wish somebody would help me today. Man, he'll change who you associate with. He'll change how you live. He'll change what you engage in. He'll change how you date. He'll change everything about you. And this is the thing. It's not to constrict you. It's to empower you. It's to set you free. And the world, my friend, does not need more worldly people. They don't, they're not looking for, I want a worldly Christian to be friends with. They need a born-again Holy Ghost filled, fired up, believer of Jesus Christ. Come on, can you give him praise in here if you believe it? Come on, give him praise if you believe it. Because I'm telling you, when his spirit shows up, it can happen to anyone, anytime, anywhere. He can save you. Some people in here today, you need to get saved. You need to say yes to Jesus today. Your heart's beating even right now. You know you're far from God. You need to say yes to Jesus. Other of you in this room, you just kind of been going through the motions. Just go on through the motions. And God says, man, i got so much for you. I've called you to so many great things. Your eye has not seen. Your ear has not heard what I have planned for you. It's time for the church to start believing God for great things. He's the God who can destroy addiction in somebody's life. He's the God who can resurrect a marriage in someone's life. Your child might be far away, but in one moment in time, the Holy Ghost can save that child. Come on, let's praise God one more time.